couple of building blocks that I want to give you this morning and a declaration that I do want to say to you is that I want to share something with you that I've never really seen before. This is something that the Lord has been pressing upon me for the last month. And um, I don't want you to approach the content of the message with preconceived notions. And what I mean by that, this is not a political message, but politics is covered. It's not an identity message, but identity is covered. It's not a marriage message, but marriage is covered in it. Please don't approach this. And I guess the kids can be dismissed, Pastor Sam. Oh, yeah, praise God. There they go. Kids, red line, praise God. I was praying for no distractions. They did really well. Everyone still good? So very important this morning, if you'll give me just the freedom to share some things with you uh, without you boxing me in for a second. Let's put all of your ideologies aside for one quick second, one series of minutes for me to share something with you that I think can help you shape your future decisions and give you clarity on what God wants to do uh, in your life. A couple of verses of scripture I want to give you just as a foundation. First one is Exodus chapter 34. Exodus, you don't need to turn there. Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. Moses and the group of Jews that are coming out of Egypt are in the wilderness, and God has called Moses to come out up on Mount Sinai. This is the place of the burning bush, which now God is going to begin to give him the Torah. He's going to give him the commandments, and Moses is up there for 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. Simple story, you probably know it from uh, uh, the old movie, The Ten Commandments, and Charlton Heston as uh, Moses. Moses goes up there, he's got dark hair, he comes down, his hair is white, he's been in the presence of God. If being in the sun causes you to be tan, then being in the presence of God causes you to have the glory of God as an array on you. When Moses comes down from being in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights, he does not realize that there's a halo over his presence and that when Israel looks at him, they see him illuminating from the glory of God. It is a residue from being with God. He'd been in the presence of God rather than have a tan. He's got the residue of the glory of God on him. We pick up on that verse. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses did not know that his skin, that his face was still shining while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses and beheld the skin of his face shining, they were afraid to come nigh to him. They were afraid of the presence of the residue that was on Moses. It wasn't God himself on him. It was the glory of God residing on Moses. And Israel saw it and they were afraid of him. And they began to hide themselves from Moses. They were fearful. Everyone still good? Came to pass that Moses says here, Uh, They were afraid to come nigh to him. And Moses called unto them, and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. But then we we see somewhat of a a sign here of what he does. It says here, um, and afterwards all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them commandments. All of the Lord had spoken with them, spoken with them on Mount Sinai. Until Moses was done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. If you're taking notes, for those of you that do take notes, write down that in order to solve the problem, Moses put a veil on his face. So Moses simply put a veil over his face in order to cover up the glory, the residue of the presence of God in order for Israel to be able to hear him. So Moses spoke the commandments of God through a veil. He couldn't speak the commandments of God one-on-one because they couldn't handle the glory of of the words that were being repeated because of the presence of the glory. Is everyone good? 
These are building blocks. This is a simple thing here. This is a veil. That veil is going to persist in all of God's relationship to Israel. When God builds the tabernacle and God says that I will dwell in the holy place, he puts a veil between the holy place and the, and the holy of holies. Because when the high priest came in, the high priest couldn't enter into that place. It needed to be veiled. And so God is going to veil himself because the people of mankind cannot handle his presence. He uses a veil. Is everyone good? He uses a veil. I find it amazing that Israel's response to the presence of God's glory on Moses is the same response to Adam when he took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says that when God was walking in the garden, he hid himself from God. He was looking for a veil. He was looking for something to cover himself. He was looking for something to protect him from the pure presence of God because he couldn't handle the pure presence of God any longer. So he created a veil. He created a skin. And now Moses, in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights, Israel's response to him is that you need to put a veil over your face because we cannot handle the pureness of the presence of God. Is everyone still good? I want to challenge you that there is a level of veiledness. There is a veil and a level of veiledness on every human, whether you're saved or unsaved. Let me make that even a little more clear as I kind of uh, build this and try to get to a point where you get a revelation for what I'm trying to share with you. We live and move in our life in what would be considered to be three parallel realms. They're all around us. They're simple realms. They're, they're, they're the simple things. There's the earthly realm, everything around. That's a simple one. There's the heavenly realm, that which was above you. There's the realm beneath you which is the hellish realm. Jesus dealt with those things. Two of the realms are invisible, meaning that the heavenly realm is invisible and also that the underworld is invisible. But the earthly realm is visible. We live and we move and we have our being in the earth. This is our domain. When God created Adam, he put him in the earth and he put him in the garden. He created him in the earth and everything around us, everything that's created in the earth is considered to be the earthly realm. Everything. Um, Jesus addresses this in John chapter 3, verse 12. I have told you earthly things and you don't believe. How then shall you also then believe heavenly things? In the earthly realm is culture, the ever-evolving culture all around us. In the garden, there was a culture. When Adam sinned against God, the culture was shifted. Adam was put out of the garden, and there was a culture. And we've been dealing with culture now in humanity for over 5,000 years. We are living in America. America has a certain culture. If you go to Nigeria, there's a certain culture. In Nigeria and China, there's another type of culture. And the culture seems to be evolving. And the things that affect this earthly realm are such things as... Government, that you'll see that throughout history. Government. Political establishments. Political parties. There's nothing new to political parties. There's nothing new to governments and earthly governments. There's also jurisprudence. If we're alive today, there are laws that govern us. This is the earthly realm. There's jurisprudence. There's such things as law, law enforcement, courts, legislation, rights and wrong, legal, that which is outlawed, that which is uh, uh, um, good, that which is not good, that which is um, a violation of the law, court systems, education. Education is another reality of the earthly realm, that which is perceived to be true, that which is accepted to be factual, the transfer of information, the reciting of historical data, that's education. Then there's faith and religion, the things that we believe and we perceive and we process about faith and passion and about eternity, about God. That's all a part of the earthly realm. Does that make sense? That's all a part of the earthly realm. The original earth started with God giving the earth to Adam. Then Adam sinned against God. 
and he lost the constitutional right to the earth. And then we find out in the Bible that Satan usurps that authority as a part of the underworld, and he becomes the god of this world. The heavenly realm, that's an easy one. That's where God resides. God resides in heaven. Uh, that is where his throne is. It is an invisible realm. We know that the visible realm works parallel to the visible realm, and those two work together. Not only is there a visible realm here, but there's an invisible realm. We see this within the Bible. The Bible is very clear about this. Uh, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created, things that are in heaven, things that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by all things, through him they exist. The writer of the book of Colossians has given us a revelation here that all things in the, this realm were created by God, by Jesus, whether they be thrones or dominions, whether they're invisible or visible, they were created by him. Invisible doesn't mean that they're not real, it just simply means that you can't see them. Gravity, we know, is real, even though you can't see it. You can't touch it. But the effect of it is absolutely real. And then there's the final part of it is the underworld. I don't have time to get into this, but Jesus addresses this. When he walks to earth, he gives us the parable. And this will be the end of the building block. And then I want to share with you uh, an important revelation of our navigation of these things. Um, Jesus shares about the rich man and Lazarus. And when they died, uh, one man went to hell, one man went to Abraham's bosom. There's an underworld. The underworld is where the throne of Satan resides, principalities and powers and rulers of this. It's almost like we don't talk about this stuff any longer, but if you're a believer and you don't believe that we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness, you are at a disadvantage to be effective in your spiritual walk. Let me say that one more time because it didn't go over that well. If you're a believer, Ephesians tells us that be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against just flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness. Rulers of the darkness. So there's a spiritual war going on. There's divine inspiration going on. God, which is in heaven, is attempting to get into you his word and his presence. Israel in their day couldn't handle the presence of God. They wanted it, veiled it. And for close to 3,000 years, as God communed with them through the law, they couldn't enter into the presence of God. They had to enter into the place of the tabernacle. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes, walks the earth, dies on Calvary, and something amazing happens at the crucifixion. Something absolutely stunning happens at the crucifixion. And what happens is, is that the veil, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, and when he had cried again with a loud voice then and gave up the ghost, there's this obscure voice. So all of this is going on, and there's this obscure connotation to what happened at the cross. I understand that darkness was defeated, the enemy was defeated, but this strange thing takes place. The veil in the temple, Jesus is being crucified on Golgotha, all the way over now in Jerusalem at the temple. That law, that veil, which God had to make, in order for Israel to commune with him, that veil that was on Moses' face, that veil that was transferred into the tabernacle, Josephus said that it was 10 inches thick, the veil, and it could hold the weight of an elephant. That veil, we see that Matthew says, the veil of the temple was ripped in half from top to bottom, and the earth did quake. You still good? 
here's what's important for you to realize. This veil is how we see life. Let me say it again. When Adam sinned, his life was veiled. It. To the degree of the veil is how we appear and how we see ourselves. Many of us, we don't see clearly because things are veiled. It. We don't, we're veiled. It. And, and the enemy of our soul is looking to add portions to the veil. And he uses everything in this world in order for you to not see clearly. So you just, you just pick any subject. Marriage. Well, there's God's view of marriage where the veil is ripped. And then there's the natural view of marriage, which has been veiled in. You take money. There's God's view of money. And then there's the veiled in view of money. You take politics. There's God's view of righteously ruling. And then there's the earthly veiled in views. The enemy of our soul, thank you for the one person that's listening. I want to give you one more verse of scripture, which I find is to be amazing. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If our gospel. So if the gospel is the glory of God, then that would mean that when Moses came down from the mountain, he had his version of the gospel, which was a version of the light. It was a covered light because Israel couldn't be able to obtain the pureness of the word. So rather than give them faith and grace and mercy, he had to give them the law, which proved that they were sinners, which then caused them to want to have grace and mercy. So Moses coming down from the hill had to take the array of God's presence and veiled it. And now the gospel writer and the New Testament writers are dealing with an unveiled gospel, the pure light of the power of Jesus Christ, that when Jesus rose from the dead, God got out of the veiled place and he now lives and dwells inside of you. And he ripped the veil in half. Bear with me as I go through this. He ripped the veil in half and the writers are saying to you, do not put the veil back on when you preach. Do not preach a version of the gospel that's been veiled in. So the writer now is simply saying this. Apostle Paul is declaring something, and it's a powerful verse. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Hid to them that are lost. That's because when Adam sinned, the light of the Holy Spirit went out, and the room of God's presence was veiled in. He no longer had a light. And Adam now lived his life through a veil. Seeing he did not see. Everything he approached in life was now veiled in. Because the light of the presence of God was no longer in him. Now he had to labor in order to be in the presence of God. And the oddity is that there was, to the tree of life, there was a cherubim with a flaming sword. What was the purpose of the cherubim with the flaming sword? The purpose of the cherubim with the flaming sword was to rip the veil in half. The problem is he couldn't rip the veil in half because that which was behind the veil was no longer pure and it would kill you. So this verse of scripture says, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. What a revelation that the apostle Paul said that he is walking around and sees all of humanity from the garden, from the garden, because of natural sin, he is saying that everyone has been blinded by the enemy. Oh, there's a level of blindness. Never before have I in my life seen the level of blindness today. When we talk about 
money. It's hard to talk about money in the kingdom because some people are still have blinders up when it comes to money. We talk about relationship. We can't talk about politics in church. You would think church would be a place that we could talk about that which is righteous, that we could be able to declare that we're pro-life, that we could be able to clear. No, no, no. But in my generation, we can't talk about this because there's a level of blindness. There's a level of blindness. So you know what the enemy does? The enemy uses, so this is the level of blindness. I mean, I can still get around and I can still see to the degree. But you know what the enemy's job is? The enemy's job is to use everything in the earthly realm. News, Supreme Court, education, public school system to just put up another veil. You raise your kids in church, you send them to school, and they, instead of learning about God's plan for mankind and creation, they learn evolution. And it's another level of blindness. And now they can't see anything. So rather than act in a way that glorifies God, they begin to act like that which they came from, animals, according to their education system. Level of blind. Are you still good? Level of blindness. I used to think that only the lost were blind. But now that I've been dealing with church folk for 35 years, no, I'm being honest with you. We're living in a dangerous time. We're living in a time where believers are putting veils on because of the way they want to live. I have had these discussions, and you know, there, there used to be a time where we would go to the Bible. So, so can I give you just maybe another, in, in is the best possible way I can get this for you to understand. So in this veil here, and I'll do it this way, this veil deals with everything around me, everything around me. Do we not have three realms we deal with? So... James tells us the wisdom that is of this earth, earth, natural, to the left, to the right of me, that wisdom which comes from earthly places, the wisdom that is derived from Harvard and, and, and Yale and earthly institutions and earthly governments is sensual. It deals with our sensuals. I got to have it. It is, it is influenced to be devilish and demonic. Why? Because it is earthly. It flowed from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when Adam sinned against God, his natural effect was to run from the presence of God. And in the first family, we see Adam and Eve. And then we see murder in the family, dysfunction in the family. We see marital issues in the family, all within the first generation. And we see this molting pot of this. And so, and so this first level of blindness is around us. But what happens is, is that when Adam sinned, there was this level of blindness. There was a veil between him and God. And here's what God says to you, that when you give your life to him, he rips the veil. And you can now have access to what God wants to do in your life. But here's what we do as believers. Any area of truth that comes from the Bible that we decide we don't want to listen to. Say that again. Last two years, I've seen people leave here. Um, I did a message called Wake Up a year and a half ago, which just simply said, don't believe everything you hear on the news. Simple thing, don't believe everything you hear. People got offended. What do you mean don't believe anything you hear? Yeah, don't believe everything you hear. Do your own research. Do your own research. Just because your doctor wants to give you a particular med, maybe he's getting a cash load of money by prescribing that med to you. Do your homework. And I'm the bad guy. That's it. We need to leave Calvary Life. Pastor John's being political. Here, fail. It's just another level of veil. Is this, is this making sense? Just another level of, of veil. So, so if we keep veiling the message and veiling the Bible, then what's left to read? This is why the most popular preachers of our day are motivational preachers. 
because all they're allowed to teach on is that which tickles us. If you're not handing out cotton candy this week, why? Because we don't want to hear about God's plan for marriage. We don't want to hear about God's plan for your money. We don't want to hear about God's plan for education. We don't want to hear about God's plan for government. We don't want to hear about God's plan and the kingdom plan to turn our cities upside down. We don't want to hear about God's plan for being an entrepreneur, about accessing wealth and turning our cities upside down. We don't want to hear about those things. So let's just cut all of that out of the Bible, handcuff the Bible, and only speak about that which tickles our fancy, we become blinded, blinded. We become blinded. Are you with me? I have so much more to say, but I don't know if you can see it. Jesus died on the cross, he ripped the veil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. Worse, we have willfully put the veil back up because of how we want to live. I took fire a year ago when I'm making declarations that are pro-life. Of course I'm pro-life. If you want to debate that issue, that's healthy. But let's look at what we all agree on to be the tool of truth, which is the Bible. So if the Bible is not, then why are we doing this? If we can't turn first to the scripture and ask God, God, should we kill the unborn? Should we, like Israel, offer our children up to Moloch? I know these are tough. Well, they used to not be tough. Now, all of a sudden, they became tough. Prior to 1962, to the public school mandate, the one-room schoolhouse, which was the education center for educating the population, was done within the church confines, and we had the Bible as a tool to educate the next generation. We didn't have these struggles. Some of you say, well, this is getting, this is getting uh, you know, we're a little more liberal nowadays. Yep, get the veil. Get the veil, I know. You need to veil it. need to censor the preacher. We censor the preacher by veiling them. We censor the gospel by veiling it. We take the Bible and we just veil it. We take, we take the Bible and we just say, you know what, all of this is not, some of this Bible is very uncomfortable. Let's just veil it. Let's just veil it. Because we don't really want some of the stuff that's in there. We want to veil it. When Jesus came to rip the veil in half, he came to set us free. You want to experience breakthrough? Breakthrough happens when the veil's ripped. Let me say once I breakthrough happens, here's, here's a level of breakthrough. By the time you get done, I mean, listening to your ethnicity, your schooling, your broken relationships and experience of life, your veil is so, I mean, your veil is so thick. that we've become blind. Does that, is that making sense? The veil has become so thick that now God is the only one that can begin to pierce that veil. Is this, is this making sense? And the enemy is all about veiling, adding veils, adding veils. He's not about ripping veils. He's about adding veils. And if we're gonna be effective, in our life, if I'm going to be effective, then I have to look at every aspect of life from, and, and I listen, anything that you see earthly, anything that's, that is around us, that, that we relate to, from employment to relationships to counsel to mentorship to life to parenting to marriage. I have areas that I'm veiled in, in and, and the Lord has got to bring me to the word of God in order for the word to be a lamp unto my feet in order for me to break the veil. 
Was it connected? Does that make sense? So over the last 30 years, 35 years of being a believer, it has been a series of God ripping veils in my life, ripping viewpoints, ripping ideologies, unveiling for me to be able to see my life the way he wants me to see it. And when he shares a truth with us and we get that revelation, then the enemy comes in trying to veil that revelation. Do you know how many people I've seen give their lives to Christ who are today not serving God any longer, it's because they had a level of freedom where they experienced an unveiledness revelation and then the enemy came in looking to veil it again and wrap it again. So if the God of this world has blinded the minds, how has he been effective in doing it? So I don't think the enemy's walking around in the essence of putting a blinder up as much as natural sin blinded us and now the enemy's just putting more veils on us and more veils on us. And then we come to Jesus and the purpose of church, my responsibility under the anointing is to rip veils. Does that make, that's why he said, if your gospel is hid... It is hid to them that are lost. Any area of my life that is lost, that needs redemption, then the Lord needs to rip the veil. And many of us, we struggle, and there is a struggle that's happening. And I think culturally there's a struggle because our, our culture is just a master at veiling the truth. Deception. Do you, do you realize the level of deception that is around all of us? Pastor John, are you saying the news media are deceivers? Yes. Yes. You can't believe any of them. And I'm not even, listen, don't read into that again. You can't almost believe anything you hear coming. You have to do your own research and you have, to, you have to dig deep. And here's the reality. That if you seek truth, the Holy Spirit will lead you to truth. Amen. Don't just believe me. No, I'm not asking you to drink the Kool-Aid. I mentioned that to my son the other day about Mr. Kool-Aid. And, and he had no, he's like, I don't know what you mean. I guess you have to be older for that. Or, <laughs> right? We know what that means. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. You know what I'm saying? So church isn't a place. I'm not going to dupe you to serve God. It is not in my best interest to manipulate you to serve God. I do not want to use external earthly things to convince you where well, you should be a member because Planet Fitness has membership. You should be a member of a church because if I, like, out of you should flow some level of truth and as you dig deep into the word of God and ask God for truth, then veils should be coming off of your eyes. Scales should be coming off of your eyes so that you can see clearly. Good sight comes from within. So, the devil works here to veil you. God works from behind the veil. Poor Dorothy didn't realize who was behind the veil. I want to go home. Some of you are clicking your feet. And she found out that the wizard wasn't a wizard. He was a carnival trickster. Here's what God says. I'm not going to deal with you from out here. I'm going to deal with you from in here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to give you a light. And when you get that light, that light's going to break that veil. And now you're going to see things more clearly. For those of you that have given your life to Jesus, did you not begin to get what we call a revelation. Something was revealed to you. This is why it's difficult dealing with, with believers because as you're mentoring, you might not have the same revelation that I have. You might not have the same level of revelation that I have. Something that has been as plain of day because why? The veil is ripped and I see clearly. You might not be able to see it clearly because you don't have that same revelation. So the idea would be is the more you study the word of God, the more you pray, the more you seek God's kingdom, you'll begin to get a revelation in every aspect of life. Revelation about relationships. Some people don't have healthy relationships because you're two victims tied to each other. 
And you argue over the same victim. See, some other individuals, they don't have good finances and they don't do the necessary things to get a revelation about finances. The best revelation that you could get does not come from earthly places. It comes from above. That's what James says. I love James. James gives us that. So I just... Um, James gives a declaration that the wisdom that comes from above is not sensual, but it is pure. That God has your best interest. The wisdom descendeth not from above, uh, that doesn't descend from above. It's earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. It's earthly, comes from earth. It's sensual. And at its core... It's devilish. We see that with the serpent and Eve. It's sensual. She said it was good to touch. She wanted to have it. It appealed to her senses. And in order for her to be able to partake of something that God said don't partake of, she had to have a replacement theology for that. So rather than having God's word, do not eat, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to relieve her from the conviction of that, the enemy declared to her that you don't need to listen to what God says. When you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall be like God. That's what gave her the authority to do it. And James says it began with it being earthly. It resided on earth. It wasn't from God. It was sensual. It appealed to what she wanted to have. And then it was Devilish. It was replacement theology. James says, for where there's envy and strife, there's confusion in every evil work, but the wisdom that flows from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And he begins to talk about that very thing. And he declares that very thing. 2 Corinthians 3.13, it says, not as Moses, he's speaking to the Corinthian church, and he says, not as Moses, which put a veil over his faith that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end to which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in Christ. Jesus gave a warning that in the last days, I'll just read you the warning, comes out of 2 Thessalonians 2.9. I'm gonna close with this verse of scripture. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Let me fill in the gap here. This is about the second coming and before the second coming, pure second coming of Jesus, we enter into a time of tribulation and there is going to be an antichrist. And when the antichrist comes, he's gonna have miracles in his repertoire of tools. He's going to have the ability to walk on water. He's going to do miraculous things. And in those lying wonders that he does, the writer here, the Apostle Paul, says, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, he says he's going to be effective in people who have a natural propensity to reject the gospel. People naturally just begin to reject the gospel. And for this cause, God will send them a delusion that they should believe a lie. The actual Greek there, a veilment. God will allow for them to be veiled it. So here's what God says. Whenever I begin to pray over something and, and I feel like God's not hearing me, you know what I check for? I check to find out, Lord, is there an area that's veiled it? Is there, is, there, is there a veil above my head? Have the heavens become brass? Are my prayers actually getting to you? Or is there a veil above my head? And that's why I don't seem to be getting answers. So then I have to dig deep and I have to ask the Lord, what veil needs to be ripped? What veil needs to be ripped? What area of my life are you trying to mold? What area of blindness are you trying to deal with? 
Is this, is this making sense? And here's what happens is once we start to get one area, things begin to get clearer. Ah, now I can see. And then things get even clearer. I want to challenge you today that in right now in our day, the level of deception, the level of veils that are being propagated all around us. You good? Yeah. Veils about sexuality. People are confused. Young people are confused about their sexuality. Why? Because they've had years of veiling now. And now the enemy is wanting to veil them in kindergarten. They want to begin to introduce them some identity confusion. And it's just another level of, I'm not asking whether you agree with me or not. I'm just simply saying that, listen, God created us a certain way. And the enemy is looking to use any way he possibly can to veil that. And there's an identity crisis in a, boy, I would have never thought that that would have been a place of contention in the 21st century. I feel like I'm such a preacher out of water. Maybe born in the wrong generation. In, a, in, in such an abundance of what David Wilkerson used to call cotton candy messages. There is a need for the pureness and, and just the, I mean, the pureness of the gospel. The gospel truth about all things. Breaking confusion, bringing clarity to a blind culture. This is not the time to hide your gospel. It's been the greatest conflict for me on a weekly basis. Lord, do I hide what your truth says? I don't want to preach on this. Here's what the Lord says. You hide that? and you don't share this message today, you're going to end up like this. Is that, does that make sense? Um, if you're a member of Calvary, you should thank the good leader. You should thank God for the staff, for the pastoral group, executive team, who have labored for years to stand on a level of truth and did not shy away from speaking things that were unpopular. Can I, can I give you a newsflash? The gospel is more unpopular today than it has ever been. And, and we are dealing with now a message that's been, for the most part, Veiled. Where's the Protestant church, 21st century? For those of us that flowed from Catholicism, I was an old altar boy. Can I ask the question? Where's the Pope on the biggest issues of today? Well, let's not argue whether, because there's this view, whether Catholics are Christian. No, put that aside. Where is the Pope on the issues of today? Why is the Catholic Church not making statements? Why are they not holding to fire every president in every country across the globe when it comes to issues of morality? Why are the Baptist ministers not shouting from the mountains? Where are, is the Protestant Church in the day we live in shouting and screaming at the top of their lungs? Why has the church become veiled in? Why has the church become veiled in? We come to church and we hear veiled in messages that have no light, no effect, removes no blindness, and people come in blinded, their minds are blinded by the devil, and they leave blinded just as they came in, and there's been no glorious light, there's been no revival, there's no, been no awakening, there's been no light shine in an area of their life. They come in veiled in, shielded, and they leave the same way. I know this isn't the way to grow a church. <laughs> if you're visiting today, be assured that if we see the flood coming, we're going to give warning of it. 
And, uh, and, uh, we're going to stand on, on scripture. Um, I am available. Like, can I, let me just say this. In any area of conflict that you have with resolving the kingdom, the Bible, and your particular ideological position, your political persuasion, your uh, ethnic persuasion, your educational persuasion, I am available for you to sit down as we open up the word of God and find truth. If you think I need to be schooled on something, bring it to me. Because that is the place where we can find truth. Only if you're willing to come to a place of agreement when we find the truth. You say, hold on, Pastor John. We in the kingdom shouldn't be pro-life. Let's come on, get your Bible. Let's go. Get your Bible, let's bring it, let's sit down, and let's argue the point so there could be conversion. Either I'm going to be converted or you're going to be converted. Either I'll be persuaded or you'll be persuaded. But let's not stay blind. If you think I'm blind and I think you're blind, let's meet. At some point, one of us is going to see. I'm open. Tithing, let's meet. Healing, let's meet. Relationship, identity. Let's meet. I am convinced that the Bible is the answer for all things. And, and, um, but don't come to me and say, don't come to me with butology instead of theology. Right? Because you know what butology is. Well, Pastor John, I know the Bible says that, but... I did a message on that years ago. I thought it was great too, Pastor Sam. I get in trouble. I do. So how many have a King James Bible? They don't use the word donkey. You know what they use? You got it, right? So I did a message called assology. I'm sorry. I thought I had such a revelation. I mean, Jesus wrote in on one. Balaam talked to one. Right? <laughs> this, here's what normally happens. We meet. We get through the opinions. We get through, well, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. Okay. Well, I apologize on how I said it, but what I said needed to be said. Right? So truth is truth. Let's spit out the bones of the vessel, and let's go back to the truth. Did I say something that wasn't true? Well, no, but I just don't like the way you package the truth. Oh, okay. So then are you going to obey the truth? No, I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to leave the church instead. And I'm going to leave based on how you package it, not on the truth. So I won't leave saying that I'm a heretic and I don't, want to, I don't want to obey the truth, I'll leave and say, Pastor John just needs to get, he just has a bad attitude, the way he packages the truth. Uh, he comes across as brash. He comes across as uh, condemning. He comes across, he could say it nicer. When you're dying in, you're, should I say, wake up? When the house is on fire and the first floor is burning, do you want me to say, wake up? Wait, wait, wake up. The house is on fire. I'd say it louder, but I don't want you to get the wrong opinion of me, so wake up, wake up. Hello? Your bed's on fire. Or do you want me to say, Wake up! Wake up! Get up! Your house is on fire! Get out of the house! Get your kids! Get your baby! Did you have to say it like that? He's so mean. 
Does this make sense? 